Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, our co-host and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Singapore, uh, Mr. Ranil Vikram Singhe, Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Dato Seri Dr. Ahmed Zahid bin Hamidi, Deputy Prime Minister of Malaysia, former President Mr. Mayum Abdul Gayum, former President of Bangla, Mr. Abul Hassan Mahmood Ali, Minister Culture Mauritius, Santaram Babu, Minister Culture Sri Lanka, S.B. Navinna, Deputy Home Minister of Malaysia, Datuk Noor Jazlan Muhammad, and dignitaries, excellencies, friends. We would like to begin proceedings by paying homage to the memory of a true friend, President S.R. Nathan. He was an important bridge in the development of a partnership and a friendship between Singapore and India that has been enduring, that has trust, and that has potential. Once again, we bow our heads in homage to President Nathan. Friends, it is my privilege to welcome you all at this conference on the Indian Ocean. Spearheaded by the Indian Foundation, this effort in partnership with the Rajaratnam School for International Studies in Singapore, the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka, and the Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies is based on our deeply held conviction that the world is a family. Sensible families sit together to find solutions. Land has boundaries, oceans have none, but that hardly means that they are not the source or reason of, for disputes. But shared space needs shared intellect for a route map that can ensure equitable prosperity. India has traveled through the Indian Ocean from a time beyond surviving historical records, carrying its literature, learning, and trade, both to the East and the known West. India has contributed what might be described as a philosophical diaspora in the region, highlighting the advantages of common wisdom, fair trade, and syncretic culture. The rest of the world understood the importance of this ocean. Ptolemy's geography, written around 150 AD, described the Indian Ocean as an enormous lake with southern Africa running right around the bottom of the half of the map to join an increasingly speculative Asia east of the Malaysian Peninsula, I quote. Uh, the point was not the accuracy, the point was recognition. In the ninth century, the Abbasid Khalif al-Mamun commissioned the first known map of the world and this showed a more accurate Indian Ocean running into the Pacific. Oceans, the most powerful and creative force and gift of nature, have been a source of prosperity when ruled by the philosophy of cooperation. They have become regions of confrontation, conflict, and conquest when misused by nations in search of domination. Domination has disappeared from the agenda of world affairs in an age of equal nations infused by the democratic spirit. History indicates that the dynamics of the Indian Ocean can lead in both directions. The sea lanes of the future must avoid both conflict on the surface and dangerous currents below in order to create new communication lines towards collective prosperity. The greatest threat to the sea has been from inhabitants of land. The Indian Ocean straddles the vast landmass called Asia. Incidentally, Asia uh, is the name of the wife of Prometheus, the god of forethought who gifted fire to man. But at this moment, Asia is in a unique position in the evolution of its geopolitics. Asia has split into two horizons. India sits in the middle. Look east from India to Japan, there is a diverse range of people, religions, language, cultures, polities, and nations. But there is one powerful factor in common. Each nation is rising from problems of the past in search of economic growth, stability, social order, and cohesion. This is what I call the Phoenix Horizon. 
look west from Asia, from its immediate western neighbor towards West Asia and Northern Africa. Within the variety of nations and peoples, the one focal factor, alas, is conflict. With some strong islands of relative calm struggling to retain their composure in a region pockmarked by war and terrorism. The rise of contemporary terrorism originates with sanctuary provided to the most vicious and barbaric terrorist individuals and organizations by our immediate Western neighbor. This is compounded by radicalization, terrorism, quasi-religious, multi-ethnic and tribal contradictions, while seepage and spread of a radical ideology that distorts Islam has incubated groups like Daesh. This is the toxic horizon. India, geopolitically in the center, has become the pivotal power of Asia. India is the western frontier of peace and the eastern frontier of war. The world must recognize India's critical role in both the quest for prosperity and the existential struggle to eliminate what Prime Minister Narendra Modi has eloquently described. Terrorism, he says, he has said, is the gravest threat since World War II. India's dual ability, one, to emancipate the Asian economy in partnership with those who seek a better life, and two, its determination to confront today's merchants of death will determine whether the 21st century belongs to Asia. India has the strength and conviction to stop the spreading scourge of radicalization because India also has an ideological answer to this menace. We offer the template of a democratic polity and modernity to counter regressive jihadism and terrorism. Prime Minister Modi knows his mind. He recognizes the dimensions of both challenge and opportunity. He is the leader that India needs at this swivel moment in our individual and collective fortunes. He has reached out with his activist policy and he has no illusions about the threat from terrorism and its malevolent sponsors who seem to be unaware that they are committing strategic suicide. Geography is a constant. But I would like to suggest that the real dynamism of India as a pivot power comes from its contribution towards the demographics of the region, its promise in both productive capacity and as an enormous market. This complements the traditional trade routes and the rising aspiration of partner nations willing to work in harmony. The Phoenix Horizon is blessed with comity and cross-cultural influences that have grown into identities along the Indian Ocean over centuries. India both complements and protects rising Asia with its powerful economies like those of Japan and China, and even more so, the growing capacities of the literal nations across the Indian Ocean to foster economic growth and stability. I can say this for my country, only those who do not know India underestimate India. India will tilt towards its deepest philosophical and historical traditions, towards peace and shared prosperity. Common sense insists that the search for prosperity must be driven by best practices across the Indian Ocean. India's policy objectives are transparent. We seek measures that will facilitate the natural flow of peaceful interaction and subsequent growth through cooperation. We do not believe that regional confrontational attitudes are helpful in the ocean or in the extended regions like the South China Sea, to give one instance. Law must be respected. After all, law preserves order. I hope that our discussions will deliberate on both the heritage and the reality of the Indian Ocean as we look to comity, commerce, and culture as the core elements that cement and strengthen economic growth peace and stability in the Indian Ocean region. Thank you all very much for being with us.